pleasure for me to introduce uh, Ben Baranat today. He is a fellow in the Kraft Center on Community Health at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, Ben's uh, education, he's, he got a degree in neuroscience at um, Amherst College and then went to medical school at NYU and then on to um, residency and fellowship at the Mass General and uh, Harvard. He's um, an internist and who is also um, a um, specialist in addiction medicine. And that's a tremendously important area, um, I think, in, in addiction sciences generally, and a, a one that, that's kind of, I would almost call it a gap, that we need more people. And um, I think of that way, uh, think that about the field generally, and then about our expertise here at the University of Vermont to have an internist who is also a, um, an expert in addiction medicine. And his area of interest, as I think you can see, um, let me, no, you can't see, <laughs> is in, is in um, infectious disease that um, corresponds to injection drug use and other uh, practices that can put uh, drug abusers at risk for um, endocarditis and HIV infection and other infectious diseases. So um, I'm really happy that Ben's here with us today and help me welcome him. Thanks, Steve, for inviting me. Thanks to the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health and UVM for hosting me. Um, I'll save you some time reading my title. Um, by the end of the talk, I, my hidden objective here is to get you interested in the kind of work that I do and it, interested in me personally, but scientifically the objectives here are to be able to distinguish between three different methods of geospatial analysis, identify barriers to care with substance use disorder who receive their care at community health centers, and be able to recognize some harm reduction strategies to mitigate risks from opioid use disorder. Um, Steve gave you some of my background. I went to Amherst College and then NYU for medical school where I got my first uh, experiences in clinical research. I was working with HIV infected and at-risk populations um, in commercial sex venues where uh, men were having sex with men and we did some important work around access, uh, assessing the acceptability and feasibility of pre and post exposure prophylaxis. So meeting people at their times of highest risk asking them about acceptability of an intervention and then ultimately rolling it out in this sort of non-traditional community-based setting. Two separate years I spent living in Durban, South Africa, the second as a Fulbright Fogarty Fellow, um, where I worked in HIV-infected and uh, tuberculosis-infected populations. Again, sort of the piece that I'll point out here is that the work that I want to do is informed by the clinical questions that I see. So the clinical work informing the hypotheses that can then be tested through rigorous research methods, and then using closing that feedback loop on the back end using the research to directly impact the care of the people who you're studying. I then moved to Boston where I did a residency in internal medicine and primary care. Um, I'm currently a combined fellow. I'm partially supported by the Kraft Family Foundation and the more traditional T32 grant mechanism uh, in the Division of General Internal Medicine. I practiced three sessions of primary and addiction care at a community health center in the Charlestown neighborhood of Boston. It's a little bit heavier load than um, other T32 funded fellows do, but it's really important for me to understand the problems that we're facing and to be an active um, physician and community member. I spend about four weeks a year attending on the addiction consultation service at the hospital, which has been up and running for about four or five years now. It's been a great experience, a lot to learn there, and it got me exposed to this problem of patients with severe bacterial infections, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, I just became boarded in addiction medicine through the American Board of Preventative Medicine earlier this week. I found out I passed the test. Yes. And I'm finishing a master's degree at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, a little bit about my family, because if I were to come here, they would be moving with me until you'd get to meet the fabulous Tabitha, who's a year old. And I like have thought about updating these photos to more seasonally appropriate, but her likeness to the pumpkin is so striking that I've decided to leave it in there. 
Winfield is three, and there's my wife, Jessica, a native Vermonter um, from Brandon, and her sister is here in the audience with us today, um, uh, and the rest of us on a trip to Martha's Vineyard over the summer. Now on to the scientific background of my talk. So accidental overdose from, uh, accidental overdose is now the leading cause of death in the United States and has been for the past few years, right? Um, the numbers here I'm showing you are outdated. We have numbers from 2017 showing that the number of accidental drug overdoses is somewhere north of 70,000. But I like showing this slide because it gives you, by way of context, um, some other points for reference, including car accidents, guns, and HIV, which going backwards you can see peaked in the early 90s in the you know, 40 to 50,000 range, and now currently outstripped by these drug overdoses by a wide margin. These deaths are largely driven by uh, synthetic opioids like fentanyl and its myriad analogs. As you can see on the top line here, those deaths have been rising pretty consistently. I think it's important for me to point out here that we best think of fentanyl as a contaminant in the drug supply. We have increasing evidence that people who use drugs would be, prefer not to be using fentanyl. It's more short acting. The inconsistency in the drug supply makes it a problem, and you have to use it more frequently. So people are avoiding dysphoria by using more frequently and putting themselves at increased risk. As you can see here, the deaths from heroin, other opioids, methadone have remained relatively stable. But deaths from cocaine and other stimulants are on the rise as well, potentially pointing to fentanyl contamination of the cocaine and other stimulant supply. On the right, you'll see a figure that sort of points to this problem as one of epidemic proportions. Um, U.S. Caucasian populations are dying at a faster rate than they have in the past 30 years. As you may know, American life expectancy has decreased over the past two years for the first time since the 19-teens uh, during the Spanish influenza epidemic. And this is in stark contrast to other developed countries in Western Europe and uh, Australia, as well as uh, striking contrast difference, striking difference between U.S. Hispanic populations and U.S. Caucasian populations. This helps us start to think about this problem like HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa, cholera epidemic uh, in other parts of the world. This is something that's really changing our society and the fabric of who and what we are. I'm going to tell you guys about three broad areas of work that I've done during my fellowship to give you some background. Um, but generally, I think I will frame this by saying um, the real focus of my work is trying to identify interesting and novel ways to work with the 85 to 90 percent of people with substance use disorder who never seek treatment. If we sat around and waited in our clinic or waited in our community health center for patients to show up and identify themselves as having substance use disorder, we'd be waiting forever. And so we need to find interesting ways to engage community members and find other novel strategies to outreach and to meet these people where they are. So the first project I'm going to tell you guys about involves a geospatial analysis of discarded needles in Boston. I'll tell you a little bit more about those methods as we get there. The second is a more traditional health services research project um, organized around a national, nationally representative survey conducted by HRSA at, their, at Safety Net Community Health Centers. And finally, as Steve mentioned, I'm really interested in these in serious bacterial infectious complications of opioid use disorder. Um, here is some data from North Carolina looking at endocarditis cases between 2010 and 2015. And the number of cases rose by 12-fold. The hospital spending on these patients rose almost 20-fold. Um, there's more up-to-date information from a recent uh, Annals of Internal Medicine paper, but the figure they had wasn't quite as good, wasn't quite as evocative of this one, so I've kept it. All right, and this, you know, let's, I know we're up against the clock, but I haven't scheduled myself to use all the time, so if there are questions that come up, please raise your hand, and I'm happy to answer them as we go along. All right, the first project I'm going to tell you guys about is about using uh, geospatial analyses to look at discarded needles. I'll just point your attention to the top headline here. It's raining needles, drug crisis creates pollution threat in New England. Um, and the picture on the left is actually from the data set that we use, some discarded syringes and a bottle cap that was used to solubilize substances. I think generally this is to highlight the fact that while people with substance use disorder may not be presenting to our clinics and to our hospitals, that there's often detritus or uh, drug use associated litter that's left behind that leaves a marker of where they were. 
This project was published in the American Journal of Public Health in an article entitled Using Publicly Available Data to Understand the Opioid Overdose Epidemic in Boston, and the objective of which was to describe the geospatial distribution of injection drug-related litter in Boston using a publicly available crowdsource 3-1-1 data set. Um, for those that are not familiar with 3-1-1, 3-1-1 is a um, non-emergency public response system where uh, people can request uh, responses to things like power outages, water main breaks. Starting in 2015, Boston layered on top of their existing 311 system a way to report uh, discarded needles in the community, and within 24 hours, someone from our A Hope needle syringe uh, exchange would come and pick it up. So needle requests could be were largely submitted by mobile app, but they could also be submitted by phone, Twitter, or website. Using this publicly available data set, it was really avail easy to identify which requests were related to needle pickups. However, as with many publicly available data sets, it was quite messy. A lot of stuff was miscoded. Every, a lot of the needles were centrally located on like City Hall inappropriately and had to be re-geocoded. But ultimately, um, we were able to clean and geocode it using ArcGIS software, and we were able to geocode all but 20 or so of the uh, needles. And we mapped almost 5,000 from the beginning of being able to report discarded needles until August of 2017. We then mapped those dropped needles back to census block groups, um, which we used because they are standardized in terms of the number of people that live within them, about three to 5,000 individuals. And you could then, in the future, map um, demographic, socio-demographic characteristics coming from the census back onto these areas. Um, we've not done that yet. There's some methodologic issues. For example, people that use and discard, use drugs and discard needles in these areas may not necessarily live there, and so mapping back on that demographic information may not be appropriate. I'm going to introduce you guys to three different analyses that we did with this data set. The first is a choropleth map, best, most easily thought of as sort of a heat map. So we took the number of needles in each census block group, divided them by the area to give us a density of needles. The higher the density of the needles, the darker the color purple here. And so you can see that in the South End neighborhood, um, South End Roxbury is the highest density of needles, but maybe I can convince you that in South Boston, uh, up into the Financial District North End, maybe in the Charlestown neighborhood where I live and work, there are higher density of needles. Um, needle reports. It's important here that I separate, right? These are not all needles found, but only the ones that are reported, and so there's some bias inherent to the sample. And this is purely a descriptive method, just describing where the needles are and uh, where the highest density is. The next analysis I'm going to show you guys is a little bit more methodologically rigorous. It is projecting only fair here. But uh, the, way, the easiest way to understand this is to imagine first that needles are evenly distributed throughout space. All right, that's our null hypothesis. We then look at each of the census block groups and ask whether that census block group has more or fewer needles than would be expected by chance alone. We then take that census block group and compare it to each of the adjacent census block groups. And that gives us high adjacent to high hotspots uh, of needles, of reports of discarded needles, low adjacent to low or cold spots, as well as these low adjacent to high outliers and high adjacent to low outliers. Again, we see the same concentration of hotspot in the South End Roxbury neighborhood. We now are starting to see some statistically significant hotspots here on the North End, right by the Charles River, as well as in the South, South Boston neighborhood. These outliers are in the Fenway District with a low high outlier and Alston Brighton, this high low outlier. You know, in order to do this kind of analysis, you have to adjust for multiple testing because there's so many comparisons. And 5,000 needles, frankly, probably isn't enough for us to really be able to see this signal. Um, the number of needles in the data set has now almost doubled to 10,000 reports. And we think in future analyses, this kind of approach is a more analytically rigorous way to help us test for hotspots um, and can also be reapplied over time to give you a sense of whether both changes in time and changes in space may give us uh, future hotspots. The next analysis I'm going to show you guys is called a buffer analysis. Uh, the way to think of this is that we drew imaginary concentric circles at 250, 500, and 1,000 meters away from areas of high social stress, and that's what number and what proportion of needles fell within those concentric circles. I'll direct your attention to the homeless shelters, because uh, that's where most of the action was. In 23 homeless shelters, if you went 
250, 500, or 1,000 meters away, we identified 26, 51, or almost 75% of the discarded needles. Um, and if you look at all of the cumulative of these 56 uh, opioid treatment programs or methadone clinics, hospitals, needle drop-off sites, and homeless shelters, we found about 75% of needles within 50, uh, within 1,000 meters of 56 of these areas, and a land mass that's representative of only 37% of Boston. So um, identifying that these areas of high social stress are l more likely to accumulate requests for reports of discarded needles. We're currently working on a counterfactual analysis where we looked at er look at areas of low social stress, and early results seem to demonstrate that areas of low social stress are likely to have fewer reports of uh, discarded needles. So this was a novel analysis of a publicly available crowdsourced data set with high temporal and spatial resolution, was selected as the best abstract of the American Society of, Ameri of Addiction Medicine comp last year. Um, and needle requests were clustered near areas of high social stress and substance use disorder. And one of the reasons that really drew me to this kind of project is that it's data that's immediately relevant to local public health stakeholders. If you're looking to start a new needle exchange, if you know that there is a recent outbreak of overdose deaths or infections, that you can then look at these data in real time to make determinations about where you might want to target your community outreach. Another important consideration here is that there are over 400 cities and municipalities in the United States that have these existing 311 programs, and it'd be really easy to layer on top of it uh, a, needle, a discarded needle program um, that engages community members to be aware of this problem and then potentially do some messaging around destigmatization and harm reduction. Uh, finally, I wanted to point out in terms of future directions, um, Thinking about are these reports of discarded needles actually associated with areas of high risk drug use? If I were you guys, that would be my, like the question that was at the forefront of my mind. On our, your left, you'll see um, everywhere that there was a needle, we put an X. And so again, you see this high density area in the south end and Roxbury, and that's our inset. And on the right, you'll see reports of overdose, likely overdoses as reported by the Boston Emergency Medical System. Um, and as you can see, the areas of our inset, the areas of highest density are very similar between reports of discarded needles and likely overdoses in the city. And this is a future area of investigation, but as you may or may not expect, Boston EMS has made accessing their data to do this kind of work like difficult and is very lagging in terms of time. The most recent data that they were willing to give me was 2015. And so when we had to think about addressing these problems in real time, EMS data, while attractive, doesn't seem to meet all of the criteria in terms about doing it in a timely fashion. Um, that's the end of this section of the talk. Uh, I'm happy to take questions about it at the end, but if people have specific methodologic or questions or concerns, I'm happy to address them now. All right, um, a little bit of background about this health services research project. As, uh, as you may know, about 7.2% of Americans uh, 12 or older have evidence of a substance use disorder. This data comes from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, NISDA, uh, which has its methodologic flaws, but is probably the best available information that we have. 5.3% of individuals in that survey had an alcohol use disorder and 2.8% with a drug use disorder. Important to note that if you add those percentages up, it's higher than eight it's higher than 7.2 because individuals off are likely to have concomitant substance use disorders. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our talk, we know that this treatment gap exists and is large. As many as 90% of individuals with substance use disorder oops, across substances um, don't receive treatment for their substance use disorder. So this project was published in the Journal of General Internal Medicine and at uh, manuscript entitled Access to Treatment for Alcohol Use Disorder at U.S. Health Centers. We used a national representative 2014 health center patient survey to identify health center populations with evidence of substance use disorder, which were defined as two or more DSM-5 criteria in the past three months. We described the continuum of alcohol and drug use disorder care and where that care is delivered and, and investigated barriers to treatment for substance use disorder among health center patients who wanted but did not receive treatment. There's sort of two stages to this. The 
alcohol use disorder variables were in the public use file, and that's the project that's already been published. And then the drug use disorder variables, we had to ask special permission from HRSA. They've now given it to us, and I will present those uh, preliminary analyses that have been accepted at a conference but are not yet published. So with regards to alcohol use disorder variables, I'll go through this so you don't have to read it. But we identified 555 individuals, or 7.5% of the weighted sample, so higher than the NISDA survey number of individuals with alcohol use disorder. On average, they tended to be younger, tended to were more likely to be non-Hispanic black, and were overrepresented in the Healthcare for the Homeless program. The Healthcare for the Homeless program provides clinical care to about 3% of the sample, but they represented about 10% of individuals with alcohol use disorder. And that will become relevant again when I tell you about the continuum of addiction care for these individuals. Individuals with alcohol use disorder were more likely to have fair or poor oral health, more likely to have severe psychological distress or lifetime drug use, and they were more likely to have used the emergency department in the past year. However, there were no statistically significant differences between hospitalization and delayed receipt of medical care, mental health care, or prescription care. Now looking at the continuum of care, um, so I'll direct your attention to the leftmost columns to get started. This represents all 555 individuals with alcohol use disorder. 37%, only 37% of individuals with alcohol use disorder discuss their alcohol use with a health professional. About 20% wanted or needed treatment, and about 15% ultimately received that treatment. So again, demonstrating this significant treatment gap. But the, all of these individuals would be appropriate to receive treatment, but only about 15% did. And there were statistically significant differences between individuals at community health centers, CHCs, and Healthcare for the Homeless programs, HCHs. With Healthcare for the Homeless programs, individuals at Healthcare for the Homeless programs more likely to discuss, want or need treatment, or receive treatment. There are sort of two hypotheses around this that I'll present to you. One, which is certainly true that individuals at Healthcare for the Homeless programs have more significant, have more uh, severe alcohol use disorder. So maybe that makes them more likely to seek and enter treatment. However, I'll also posit that individuals at Healthcare for the Homeless programs are, Healthcare for the Homeless programs are more accustomed to dealing with stigmatized patient populations as people with housing instability are stigmatized at baseline, and potentially these programs are better able to deliver care to uh, other stigmatized conditions like substance use disorders. Among the individuals who did receive treatment for their alcohol use disorder, only 25% received treatment at the healthcare center where the survey was administered. The other 75% had to seek treatment elsewhere, representing a significant barrier. And among the respondents who wanted but didn't receive alcohol use disorder treatment, the most common responses about why they didn't receive that treatment are the usual suspects. Skepticism, stigma, logistical and financial barriers has been demonstrated and redemonstrated in many studies over time. Turning briefly to the drug use disorder variables, we identified 374, 4.5% of the sample with a drug use disorder, again, higher than in the NISDA survey from 2017. And the most common substances of use were cannabis, cocaine, stimulants, sedatives, and opioids. This sample here starts to give you a little bit of a peek behind the curtain about how these weighted samples work. Sedatives, 72 individuals said they had, or had, had used sedatives, representing 21 point. 21% of the weighted sample, and 71 individuals had used opioids, which represented 10.6% of the weighted sample. So in using these nationally representative surveys at small sample sizes, um, the point estimates tend to be a little bit funny, and I just wanted to highlight that for you guys. I also wanted to point out that 3.1% of individuals without evidence of a current drug use disorder had ever injected drugs. And that allows me to make the really important point that people with substance use disorders do recover. They enter durable and sustained recovery and lead lives uh, that are as full as anyone else's. And to really be mindful of that, and that's an important way to help um, fight stigma and to treat people equitably. With regards to the continuum of drug use disorder care, again, we see these step-offs from 50% of individuals uh, discussing care down to under 30% ultimately receiving drug use disorder care. There were no statistically significant differences here in the community health center and healthcare for the homeless programs, potentially owing to sample size that looking, the eyeball test might tell us that healthcare for the homeless programs um, maybe seem a little bit better at taking people from discussing drug use disorder care to receiving that care, but no, again, no statistically significant differences. 
So sub symptoms of substance use disorder were perhaps more common than in other national samples, and this study corresponds to about 30 million Americans. A minority of individuals with substance use disorder discussed that care, and even fewer wanted or received that care, and the barriers to receiving that care were the usual suspects, stigma, financial logistical barriers, um, and the co-location of services. All right, and that brings me to the end of this uh, health services research portion. Next, we're going to transition to talking a little bit about these serious bacterial infections associated with injection drug use. On the upper left, you'll see uh, the number of hospitalizations related to opioid use disorder has at least doubled between 2002 and 2012, and we think that that number is actually likely much higher. This number has garnered the attention of professional societies, including the HIV Medical Association, the Infectious Disease Society of America, as well as the public press. Um, this is an article from the New York Times that was published uh, last year um, that unfortunately used some stigmatizing language to talk about individuals with substance use disorder. Uh, I'll point out here that they, how many chances should a user get? Right, that kind of language conflates a person with a substance use disorder with the, that substance use, calling them a user. Right, if they used person with substance use disorders, more appropriate sort of person first language, and the way that these uh, items, these things get written about in public press really shapes our framework and the way that we think about them, and that we could be doing a better job. Um, but it's a really important issue and one that I'm glad that they wanted to uh, address in the New York Times. The natural course of people with substance use disorder and these severe bacterial infections is dismal. This is a retrospective cohort from Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. Uh, over, it was just over 100 patients with opioid use disorder associated endocarditis. Over 25% of these individuals had died at 10 year follow up at a median age of 41. Fewer than a quarter saw an addiction consultant in the hospital. Under 10% had a plan to be on medication to treat their opioid use disorder, and none were prescribed the life-saving antidote to opioid overdose, naloxone. This question was really motivating to me during my clinical training, something that I saw a lot of. We were really good at treating the infection, the proximate cause of their hospitalization, but really bad at thinking about the underlying cause of their, their hospitalization, their addiction. And without treating their addiction, we see that these patients end up back in the hospital or dead at really young ages. So I set out to conduct a qualitative study with some colleagues, which uh, the objective of which was to understand the experiences of care with opioid use disorder associated endocarditis, as well as the experiences of the multidisciplinary healthcare providers who deliver that care. And then the bottom here is the oversimplified schematic that we came up to understand um, care for these patients who may not have otherwise presented to the hospital if it wasn't for their infection. So from the hospital to post-acute care or a skilled nursing facility, often to, to finish out their six weeks of antibiotics, and then eventually returning home, and that these were moments where the healthcare system was touching them and had an opportunity to alter their uh, course of care. So we interviewed individuals with uh, adults with a diagnosis of culture positive endocarditis and opioid use disorder uh, based on DSM-5 criteria, and they needed to have completed an index admission and treatment at MGH. We then asked them to reflect retrospectively on a completed episode of care rather than asking them about their current care. Some were re-hospitalized for endocarditis, but specifically we were asking them about their previous completed episode of care. We purposefully sampled a diverse group of patients and providers. Patients were, recru were recruited from inpatient settings, where we thought that individuals were more likely to have had co additional complications and were le more likely to be doing not well with regards to their addiction care, as well as outpatients at the time of return to primary care, where we thought patients were more likely to be doing well. And then prov providers, we sampled from units where Individuals with opioid use disorder associated endocarditis are often seen, and we surveyed um, or we interviewed nurses, physicians, case managers, social workers, um, represented the bulk of the sample. I conducted the semi structured and recorded interviews and a demographic questionnaire and transcribed, and three of us independently coded these uh, interviews using a grounded theory approach. And as is appropriate in grounded theory, we enrolled to thematic saturation when individuals are not telling you anything new that you don't already know. So in reviewing subsequent interviews, you haven't developed any new themes to be included in your codebook. 
So you have your list of 20 codes. You read the 24th interview, and no new themes have arrived. That tells you that it's time to stop sampling based on a grounded theory approach. So ultimately, there were 11 uh, patient participants in our sample. Half of were inpatients, half were outpatients. They were a median age of 38, with most identifying as white, unemployed or disabled, without stable housing, uh, and mostly female. Again, this is consistent with national samples of endocarditis patients and really similar to the sample I showed you guys from Beth Israel with high morbidity and mortality. And we recruited 12 provider participants who are mostly female, mostly white, and mostly cared for patients with opioid use disorder almost always, giving us a sense that they were knowledgeable about the care of these individuals. There were five major themes that uh, we identified, I'm going to tell you guys about a little bit more about the first three, the lack of coordinated and longitudinal care, differing experiences of long hospitalizations. This was a theme where the providers and the patients had quite different perspectives. And relapsing substance use is being quite common. The two I'm not going to tell you as much about today are the severe social and medical comorbidity. So patients came into the hospital with low social determinants of health, often with comorbid psychiatric and medical illnesses, and often left the hospital having accrued additional com complications. The one piece that I'd like to point out here is that a lot of these patients with endocarditis develop severe neurologic sequelae, hemorrhagic or embolic strokes related to their endocarditis, and that they had severe neurologic needs that were required, uh, required extensive post-acute care, some of which could not be delivered by virtue of having addiction or being on medications to treat their addiction. And lastly, sort of unsurprisingly, that stigma and discrimination led to delayed and unequal care. That individuals with opioid use disorder delayed presentation to the hospital, they experienced uh, delays in surgical intervention, and the care that they received was like markedly different. The providers were able to tell us that the care that individuals with opioid use disorder received was different from individuals with endocarditis but not opioid use disorder. I'm going to take you through some representative quotes um, for the top three major themes. Lack of integration and discontinuity of care. A patient told us, I knew I wanted to get on Suboxones for like the last three years, but there's a waiting list. There's a list that you have to wait and wait and wait, and you just get tired of waiting, and then you just whatever. You're just like, screw it. A case manager told us, sometimes we do all this great work for two or three weeks with a patient in the hospital, then they go to a post-acute care facility for six weeks of antibiotics, and there's no one there to continue the plan. So all that hard clinical work they did kind of falls away. I'll use this theme to point out that individuals with opioid use disorder-associated endocarditis experience really difficult, real, real challenges um, transitioning their care from the hospital to post-acute care, where there's often not an appropriate setting, and from post-acute care back to their home communities, where they need to be connected with primary and addiction care. And, um, you know, that they're just not enough Suboxone providers. I think that the medications for addiction treatment was a big barrier here for these individuals. That, um, being able to be linked effectively to an outpatient provider from the hospital or post-acute care just wasn't happening for them, and that a lot of patients relapsed during that transition time. The experiences of prolonged hospitalization. So a patient told us, the isolation of being alone in the room all the time is something I have a hard time with. And with addiction, I was actually calling out for help a lot. I was depressed. An addiction social worker, on the other hand, told us, people with endocarditis are in the hospital for a long time, and it's a big opportunity for us to be able to elicit some type of change talk. Maybe we can talk about cleaner needle practices. Maybe we can get them connected to a shelter. I'll use this theme to highlight the difference here, right? Patients saying that they felt um, that these hospitalizations were unnecessarily long, that their addiction, their pain were undertreated, and that they really wanted more support during the time of hospitalization. Providers, on the other hand, saw this as a teachable or reachable moment, that individuals with severe opioid use disorder, this was an opportunity to get them started on medications, to talk about harm reduction, to link them effectively to care, and that there's a tension here. Specifically, um, individuals, the patients, asked for more peer supports in the hospital. Were there going to be groups where they could meet with other people with addiction? Could they meet with a recovery coach? Could they get treatment specifically for their addiction? Could they, you know, have freed more freedom to move around the hospital? Um, 
And that's something that increasingly is being done at MGH, and patients reflect it sometimes directly that they had more autonomy and had more opportunities to do what they wanted, but still felt that hospitalizations were unnecessarily restrictive and long. And then relapsing substance use is a common outcome for these individuals. A patient told us, I was in that hospital for four months and could have passed a lie detector test stating that I would never use again. The day I got out, I had a needle in my arm, getting high again, wondering how the hell I got there and what happened. An infectious disease provider told us, I don't think that we do a good job in terms of educating patients on how not to infect and what the chances are of fatality with a second and third or if they make it after their first infection. I'll use this theme to highlight the centrality of harm reduction strategies, that telling patients that they can never use drugs again, that we won't treat them if they use again, is unrealistic and not actually reflective of the relapsing, remitting nature of substance use disorder. And that regardless of what we do for these patients, starting them on medications for addiction treatment, we also in parallel need to be providing them with harm reduction strategies. So when they do relapse, they use in safer ways that protect the heart valve that we may have recently replaced and help them lead long and fulfilling lives. So this analysis revealed a young, critically sick, and stigmatized patient population who often develop new physical and mental comorbidities on top of their pre-existing ones. And this study highlights multiple patient and health system factors that may explain the poor clinical outcomes experienced by individuals with opioid use disorder-associated endocarditis. This project was presented at an, the ASAM National Conference last year, and the manuscript is currently uh, under revision and resubmission to uh, an addiction journal. I'm going to go back briefly to the retrospective cohort from Beth Israel Deaconess to talk about two specific areas for improvement. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about naloxone and an area of advocacy that I'm working on, um, and then to talk about future directions for my research to drill down a little bit on these medications for opioid use disorder treatment. So first, a word about naloxone or Narcan. This medication for any patient with opioid use disorder in the hospital should be prescribed at discharge. In Massachusetts, if we didn't prescribe it, there's a standing order throughout the state where an individual can go to the pharmacy and ask to be uh, given a dose of naloxone. It's really easy to use. The training is available with a physician or at the pharmacy, where a pharmacist will train you how to use it, and that there's increasing evidence that we should be training both people who use drugs as well as their family, friends, and partners. Uh, this has been a major thrust of work by um, the current Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, who you may or may not know, his brother uh, has an active, had active substance use disorder and has been incarcerated for a lot of his adult life, um, and that Jerome Adams has highlighted that knowing how to use naloxone and keeping it within reach can save a life. Be prepared, get naloxone, save a life. Motivated by this call to action along with physician, colleagues, uh, pharmacists, people in long-term recovery and Army veterans, we started a nonprofit um, like a nonprofit startup called We Are Allies, um, the goal of which is to get people wear their naloxone externally in a purple branded We Are Allies case to wear your activism against opioid epidemic as like a literal badge of honor. So we sell these uh, allies cases, give you education on how to use the medication, teach people to speak in non-stigmatizing non ways about uh, substance use disorders, and we've launched a social media campaign around this. We have about 75 allies in Massachusetts and generally New England so far, and we've raised about $25,000 in foundation money um, to get us started, and it's been a really rewarding piece of what I'm doing, even though it's not directly related to any research objectives at the moment. Transitioning back to uh, the medications for opioid use disorder, these med medications for opioid use disorder, in particular methadone and buprenorphine, work. Right? We don't need to, I don't need to demonstrate, that doesn't need to be re-demonstrated. But in the best uh, uh, meta-analysis of these medications, that methadone reduced uh, overall deaths, all-cause mortality, from 13.5 to 5.8 deaths per thousand person years, and buprenorphine reduced death from 10.9 to 4.5 deaths per thousand person years. So 50 to 60 percent reductions in all cause mortality in individuals in all comers. A lot less is known, however, about whether these medications work in treating the underlying addiction to improve care for these serious bacterial infections in people with opioid use disorder. 
So if I were going to ask this question in a rigorous way, the first one that I would have is that can people with opioid use disorder and these serious bacterial infections, which I define as not just endocarditis, but septic arthritis, osteomyelitis, uh, peri uh, abscesses near the spine, paraspinal abscesses, can these individuals be recruited from the hospital and retained in a cohort? Right? These individuals often have unstable home lives, um, often criminally justice involved, and even demonstrating that you can follow them for a period of time seems like a major question that should be asked. What are their medications for opioid use disorder treatment preferences, and what are their experiences? Right? I think that they're not going to be great, but understanding what their experiences are not going to be great, but understanding what their preferences are is a really important piece before implementing a strategy. And is increased uh, medication treatment engagement associated with reduced addiction severity and improved outcomes? I think that these are particularly timely questions to ask um, because of these long-acting buprenorphine formulations, which are just hitting the market now. So sublocade is... Uh, about $1,500 a dose, abdominal subcutaneous injections that are given once monthly, two loading doses, followed by maintenance doses. And one of the tricks for this medication is that they need to be, uh, they need, the person needs to be on sublingual buprenorphine for seven days prior to starting the subcutaneous injections. However, for hospitalized patient populations, um, this won't be a problem because people will be there to transition. And then Brixadi, which was tentatively approved in December 20. 18 and costs currently unknown will have weekly and monthly formulations and no need for sublingual administration prior to starting the subcutaneous injections. So I think that these medications, we think we need to figure out whether they're acceptable in these patient populations. Um, so as I start to think about how we would implement these, medic, implement these long-acting buprenorphine formulations, can individuals be effectively recruited? Do these medications solve a real problem? Are they acceptable? Even if they're very effective, if the acceptability is low, these medications won't really be an effective piece of our armamentarium. And then what services should be offered in concert? And based on my preliminary work in the qualitative study, I would point out that like the mutual support, peer support in the hospital, and that harm reduction should be a key piece. Um, for example, but like mandatory counseling, which has been studied a number of times for medications for opioid use disorder, maybe is less important. And I would start with the experts to ask these questions, um, starting with patients, like, recruited through the addiction consultation team, through a bridge clinic or a low threshold BUP service, which I know is currently available at the harm reduction service at the Needle Exchange here in Burlington. Um, I would ask individuals, uh, providers from primary care and specialty care. I think that post-acute care facilities are really under-examined piece of the, the ecosystem here. Um, and as we think about implementing these expensive medications, cost effectiveness is a key piece. In an accountable care organization, population health world, that we, uh, you know, that healthcare systems are going to pay for these individuals now, we're going to pay for them later. And spending $1,500 up front for doses of these medications may end up being quite cost effective. As I start to think about who might want to fund this work, I know that University of Vermont has an internal grant program where they'll match funds that are put up by a department. Um, the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health has a COBRA or COBRI grant that funds junior investigators. Um, if I stick just with endocarditis, the American Heart Association has a career development award program that's longstanding. However, I think that the problem is a little bit broader than just endocarditis. While it's a model disease, it's not doesn't represent like the full range of what we're seeing here. And ultimately, this is all in service of uh, a career development award from the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute on Drug Abuse in particular. And I'm looking at about a year timeline to having a first draft of an award uh, grant proposal into them. So substance use disorders and its complications are major drivers of morbidity and mortality in the United States, but few individuals with substance use disorders are receiving appropriate treatment. I'm well trained clinically and boarded in addiction medicine and have specific postdoctoral research training in substance use disorders. And I have experiences in geospatial approaches using like we'll call them medium sized data sets to investigate access and barriers to treatment and engaging with an innovative recruitment of stigmatized patient populations. Um, and with that, I will end. And thank you guys so much for coming out to hear me talk today.
overdose with opiates was the number one cause of death. That had to be, it wasn't labeled by age. That had to be in a younger group because across the board, it's heart disease and cancer, right? Right. So this is the, it's a, that's right. It's the leading cause of accidental death in the United, accidental death in the United States. But you're right. There are other disease states that outstrip them and particularly later in life. And that the, like, if you're thinking about it in terms of qualies or morbidity, mortality, the real lever there is that these people are young, otherwise healthy folks who are losing a lot of um, life. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that study did. It would probably be under, underpowered to look at it since just it was under 10% of, indi or I guess it was 25% of that sample received addiction consultation. In subsequent studies that have looked at it, addiction consultation seems to be associated with reduced rates of readmission to the hospital at least and is likely associated with um, better outcomes for those individuals. But it hasn't been studied systematically and if you've seen one addiction consultation service, you've maybe just seen one addiction consultation service, that the providers, the makeup of the teams, how, how much they can do has, in my experience, been pretty variable. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity there to sort of standardize what should be in these services or what is like the special sauce of a service that may actually improve outcomes. But I think that a big piece of it is just being able to provide the medications, right? If you have, can start patients on BUP, methadone, or if appropriate uh, naltrexone in the hospital, that that would go a long way. And I'd say probably the other big piece I've seen across addiction consultation services is the linkage piece. Like, does the system have a key person who knows not just the, the addiction providers in the neighborhood, but if someone's coming from further afield, more rural places, how do we link them successfully to care? Yes. And the Kentucky group was there, and they're using um, hospitalization for endocarditis as an event where they try and initiate um, medication assisted treatment. So I'm curious if we might kill two birds with one stone. I'd like to hear um, what you're doing along those lines at MGH, and then I'm hoping maybe um, some folks in the audience can say what we're doing here at UVM. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, so Laura Finucci and other folks at University of Kentucky are doing a great job both delivering addiction care to these patients, but also starting to think about how we can study it in a systematic way. They've done some really innovative work around getting patients out of the hospital earlier, getting a curated group of patients out of the hospital with pick lines, returning them home earlier to their home communities and linking them to addiction care. Um, at MGH, patients with these severe bacterial infections almost uniformly are seeing an addiction cons consultant during the hospitalization. Um, for the most complicated case cases, we're convening an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary team to talk about them, which consists of cardiac surgery, cardiologists, addiction, um, infectious disease, and the general medical team. So on an ad hoc basis, we get together to discuss the most challenging cases. Um, and then on a monthly basis, we're reviewing cumulatively all the cases that have been seen um, and starting to accumulate like at least a case series of individuals because we're operating in a data-free zone. Who, to whom should we offer surgery? To whom you know, should we wait and get their addiction under better control before we offer them surgery are still really open questions. Um, and so that's where we have gotten started. But I think that there's lots of room to improve and to codify around that. Just yeah. Just for my own information, um, what proportion get put on for methadone while they're hospitalized? So from our early data, it's about between two thirds and three quarters on stars are on medication for addiction treatment during the hospitalization. Um, so far higher than in the other retrospective samples that have been looked at but probably a ground where we should be looking, right? There's some group of patients who may have pain needs that are above and beyond what can be delivered with bup or with methadone, um, and so maybe it's not appropriate to start them on medications for addiction treatment right away, but I think ultimately our goal needs to be 100%, and anything short of that is probably on a, should be on a case-by-case -case basis.
handing you a warm uh, thanks for the credentials and for the opportunity to introduce the fund uh, for the health coordinator uh, here at Action for the Snow. And for Comfort Station Field, the Nice Health Group has played a significant role in both the management service, where hiding the inmates along with some of the community work that it looks like the health center. So it's a very similar effort. Are you guys aspiring to that hundred percent? I can't. I don't know the yeah. infectious disease part, but it's such a great opportunity to get to have it won already on that patient-assisted treatment. I can't see any reason why we wouldn't. I mean, I think that for opioid use disorder, that's really the standard of care and what we should be aiming for. I think some of the complexity is that people with injection drug use disorders are using things other than opioids that don't respond to these medications, right? If you are using methamphetamine or cocaine or any substance that you're injecting, we don't really have the same effective treatment. And so in some ways, those individuals may represent sort of look, they, they might look more like the historical control group. Right, because we can't offer them treat. We don't have a medication to treat their addiction, and so they might be the natural control for some of these experiments going forward. This is the first instance I've ever heard of what you just described. But I was thinking that we have contingency management for the psychomotor stimulants, almost as effective as as a medication. Yeah. So for those in those cases, there could be a consult to try and have that initiated and start it while they're still in the hospital so that you could give them a history of success. Yeah, I think you're the expert. The thing that I think we would want to avoid is having anyone released without applying some evidence-based um, treatment, starting some. Yeah. You know, I think that in Boston and maybe New England generally, that opioids represent the preponderance of injection drug use. Um, but there, people do co-use, right? People will use that a stimulant may be their primary substance of use with an opioid sort of as their landing gear to come down afterwards. And so trying to identify those patients and getting them connected to treatment seems, this seems like an obvious opportunity. mentioned having this slide on the um, opioid substitution therapies and how we don't have to re you know, prove that once again. Well, contingency management for psychomotor stimulants, is, the evidence is as strong as, as the opioid substitution therapies for opioid use disorder, but I've never before right now heard um, it discussed as an option for um, these endocarditis patients, but it should be. I mean, rather than having them go out uh, without some intervention because we don't have a, a pharmacy. Well. Yeah. No, I think that the point that you make is really a broadly important one, that these strategies have been studied in a lot of different settings, and that maybe the mo more important thing for us to figure to work out now is how we implement them appropriately. Um, and are there different implementation strategies that we can study and compare? Because I think that if we can demonstrate that they're effective, this is a problem that's big enough and expensive enough to care for that I think that insurers, healthcare systems, ACOs are going to listen. Thank you guys so much for coming.